Okay. Hello. Welcome. I hope you are ready to continue. Today we are going to finish uh, SIMD processors very quickly. And after that, we will talk and, about uh, graphics processing unit. And, uh, and after that, we will, uh, we will start the weekend. So uh, that's the plan for today. Uh, the first thing that we are going to uh, take a look at, uh, we will quickly recall some of the concepts that we introduced yesterday, and then we will recall uh, something else that was covered in previous lectures, but it's important to uh, keep that in mind uh, for the, for the uh, rest of the lecture. Um, uh, remember that we are uh, right now here, other execution paradigms after having talked about single cycle, multi-cycle machine, pipelining and out of order execution. And among these uh, other execution paradigms, we find uh, very long instruction war architectures, fine grain multi-threading, systolic arrays, decoupled access, access execute, and now we are with the uh, uh, SIMD processing and the GPUs. These are the required readings, I mean required, one required and the other one is recommended. Uh, both are very important for today's lecture. We are going to actually start with the uh, recommended one because the first thing that we are going to talk about is about the SIMD, SIMD extensions in uh, in current uh, CPUs, and then uh, we will start with the uh, uh, GPU architecture. So uh, remember, SIMD processors are very good at exploiting uh, regular data parallelism. They are not so good for irregular data parallelism, even though somehow GPUs are a little bit uh, let's say closing uh, this gap because they have uh, some interesting features that um, we are going to describe today. Also recall that CIND processors and uh, also GPUs correspond to uh, one of the four categories CMD that uh, Mike Fling uh, introduced or described in, in his paper in 1966. Um, the four categories are single instruction, single data. The best example is a sequential CPU, uh, SIMD. Uh, we have array processors, vector processors, and GPU, and a special combination of both. Then we have multiple instruction, single data architectures, and finally, uh, multiple instruction, multiple data architectures, where we can have micro um, uh, multiprocessors or multi-core processors these days. Uh, okay, so uh, let's continue with that. In SIMD process processing, recall in the SIMD processors, we have multi -pro multiple processing elements, and the way that we are going to use these multi uh, multiple processing elements will depend on what we call the time-space duality, which actually uh, helped us to uh, differentiate between array processors and vector processors. And you, uh, uh, I'm pretty sure you remember this slide, the comparison between array processors and vector processors. In array processors, we have uh, an array of processing elements, each of which can execute different types of instructions. Uh, in this case, for example, load, add, multiply, and store are executed on the same processing element. So, uh, in the same time, as you can see, in the same time, we have the same operation in different um, uh, processing elements. In the case of the vector processor, we have kind of specialized processing elements, uh, and each of them is executing a particular type of instruction. So here, in the same cycle, in the same time, we have different operations executing uh, in the SIMD processor. So yeah, that's the time and space duality. In the same space, in the array processor, we have different operations. In the same space, in the vector processor, we have the same operation. Uh, we were also talking about memory banking because if we want uh, the SIMD processor to be efficient, we need to have an efficient uh, access to memory. Why is that? Because uh, in memory, it's where we have the operands, where we uh, read data from and we write to the results. 
Um, and we have a lot of uh, multiple uh, processing elements. So in order to feed all these uh, multiple processing elements, we need to have a very efficient access to memory. And the way of uh, doing that is having a multi-banked memory. The good thing here is that we can be accessing all the banks at the same time, and uh, we can issue one request to each of this, these banks uh, in uh, each cycle. Uh, recall also that... Uh, uh, one problem that we can have is that we cannot be, in principle with this configuration, we cannot uh, be uh, performing two accesses at the same time to the same memory bank, right? So if we uh, really want to be efficient, what we could do is uh, having more than one port, which means that we will have more than one memory data register and more than one memory address register per bank, right? So that's... Uh, um, uh, a way of, uh, in this case, we will be doubling the bandwidth, right? And I got a very nice question, very good question at the end of uh, uh, the uh, lecture yesterday, and the question was, what happens, I mean, we can put there more ports, right, in each of the banks, but what happens because uh, with the data bus and the address bus, because we can still have uh, only let's say, one single uh, uh, data element in the data bus, right? That's a, a good question. Uh, keep in mind that we don't describe the very, you know, exact details of how things are implemented in computing systems. But it's very good that you uh, ask yourself these questions because that's actually the way that uh, it should be for, for, for us to be able to uh, improve computing systems, right? And um, the... So I, I, I can have two potential answer, two possible answers for this. One possible answer is that we are not talking about what's the width of the data bus here, right? So if uh, the input, the element that we are reading from uh, the bank has, let's say, 32 banks, but the width of our uh, data bus is 64 bits, we can have two elements at the same time on the data bus. That's one possible answer. Another possible answer is that both components of the system can be working at a different frequency. And if the, if the frequency of the data bus is higher than the frequency of the uh, memory, uh, we can also uh, be able to um, issue more, I mean, to move more data uh, around, right? Do you have any question? Yeah. Um, that's related to what I just said, right? To what I just explained. I mean, within the memory, would we do two memory accesses based on the two MARs at the same Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's, that's, that's the idea. Having two ports means that you are going to have two MARs, two addresses that are being accessed at the same time. That's the idea. Okay, any other question? Okay, yeah, uh, this, uh, we also uh, talked about this slide yesterday. Uh, we have one instruction, a vector addition, A plus B uh, equals C. Uh, this is a vector instruction, and you know that every time that we want to execute a vector program, we first need to define what's the vector length, right? But this vector length, it's more, or yeah, let's say that it could be more like a software concept because the way that the uh, different elements that are going to be computed with the vector instruction are going to be executed on the hardware will depend on the hardware that we have, right? So for example, on the left-hand side, you see a, a pipeline um, ALU, a pipeline uh, a functional unit, uh, where in each cycle we start the execution of the addition A plus B for the corresponding element. So in this case you see C C0, uh, C C1, C2, and so on. In every cycle we will be obtaining one result. In this case, what we have is four functional units that can be working in parallel. Uh, but observe that the number of inputs that we have there, it's uh, actually in total is 28, right? So what we are doing here is that we are uh, distributing the uh, computation, all the input elements that we need to, comp to operate on, we are, going, we are distributing them in space and in time. So we are taking advantage of the 
a pipeline uh, design of each of these functional units, and also at the same time, we're taking advantage of the fact that we have more than one functional unit. And, um, and we also uh, described this uh, slide in which you can see uh, what are called the vector lanes. Each of these columns that you can see here is called a lane. And uh, in this lane, we can have one, two, or maybe uh, more functional units. Observe also that each lane has access to a certain number of registers. So uh, in the end, what we have here is like a huge register file, and every time that we are going to uh, execute some uh, program, we will distribute all the registers in the register file among the different lanes, such that uh, the different um, uh, vector elements are going to be placed in the corresponding registers, uh, the, the registers that, that correspond to each of the lanes. Um, related to this, and also related to the previous slide, we. Uh, very quickly showed in the uh, very last minute this uh, slide, where um, actually I think it, it, uh, it should be useful to understand uh, what's the difference between the vector length and the actual number of lanes. So in this example, for example, uh, in this example, we are considering that we have 32 elements per vector register. So assume that your vector length is 32, but the number of lanes that we really have is not 32, is eight in this case. So it's as if we had, instead of four of these elements here, we would have eight of these elements. So what this means is that in every single cycle, we cannot execute the operation for the 32 input elements. We can only operate on eight input elements. So if we want to issue one load instruction on the load unit for the 32 elements of the vector registers, we will have to do something like this. In the very first cycle, we start the execution for uh, eight of the vector elements, then for the next eight, and then for the next eight. In total, we need four cycles to execute or at least issue the, the entire um, instruction on the uh, load unit. This number of cycles, four in this case, is called chime. Um, uh, remember that um, in the next cycle, we can start also issuing another instruction in another unit, in this case, a multiply unit, and then uh, the add unit. And as soon as we finish the load instruction, the first load instru instruction, we can start the execution of a second load instruction, and then another multiply instruction, and then an another add instruction. Observe that uh, in one single cycle, here, we are, how many, uh, where is my, okay, I can see it now. Uh, we, we are executing like, 24 operations in one single cycle, right? And in total here in, in this toy example, we are executing 192 operations in 10 cycles. So it's uh, quite uh, productive, I would say, very, very fast. Okay, let's continue. I think we also uh, talked yesterday about uh, vectorization. Um, what does it mean? It means that if uh, we have some sequential code like the, the uh, code segment that you can see, or these two lines of code that you can see there that essentially are a vector addition, a ve two vectors of uh, size n. We are adding element-wise and storing the result in C. Um, well, if uh, we have a code like this, we could do some kind of uh, loop dependence analysis, and if there's no, or a compiler could do, I mean, a, a smart programmer can do it, and a compiler can also do it, right? Some sort of loop dependence analysis, and if there is no dependency uh, across, uh, across uh, iterations of the loop, we can vectorize this code, and uh, finally the code will look like something like this uh, that you have on the, on the right, and um, each of these, uh, uh, rectangles uh, that you uh, see here, uh, they are um, each of the uh, vector instructions, right? So we start with one vector load, after that another vector load, then vector add, and vector store. We are going to uh, see this slide again uh, a couple of times today. And the uh, summary, uh, we already finished here. Uh, what uh, we were supposed to finish yesterday is uh, this slide in which, uh, I mean, it's just like a summary to, for you to recall that uh, CMD machines are very good for regular data parallelism. 
Um, we can obtain a lot of uh, performance improvement by vectorizing the code, by uh, writing the code in a uh, vectorized manner, but remember Amdahl's law. Uh, it won't be possible to parallelize everything, to vect vectorize everything. I mean, maybe in some codes uh, for sure, but uh, probably not in all real world codes. So we will always have some uh, sequential fraction of the uh, application that is going to limit uh, what's the maximum speed up that we can get for, from a vector uh, matching because of Andal's law. Um, yeah, yesterday we were talking about some example of uh, vector matching. Uh, we, we show some schematic of this uh, Cray one and also the picture about the uh, Cray um, that we have in, in the CAB building. Uh, these days uh, where you can find uh, seeing the operations using uh, uh, like like uh, multimedia, what are called the multimedia extensions in uh, current CPUs, right? Uh, like for example, these ones that you can see um, in the slide. And actually, that's what we are going to talk net next about the SIMD operations in modern ISAs. And in particular, we are going to talk about. Uh, MMX instructions in uh, Intel x86 processors. So you already know that CMD operations are good, CMD instructions are good to uh, whatever we have a lot of uh, regular uh, code, I mean, um, yeah, regular operations, uh, regular parallelism. And for example, one uh, field where we can find this is graphics processing. Uh, or image processing, right? Why is that? Because in the end, we are operating on images, and an image is composed of many pixels, many uh, hundred thousand or even millions of pixels, and uh, we typically, in this uh, kind of computation, we uh, apply the same computation on the same pixel. So that is why uh, CMD processors are very good, that these CMD uh, ISA extensions are very good for graphics and for image processing. And actually that's what they uh, noticed, uh, the designers, computer designers in the 90s, when they started introducing these CMD extensions and CPUs. And the reason why they decided to do that is because um, uh, app multimedia applications have started to be more and more popular. I mean, maybe 30 years ago or 40 years ago, they were not so popular. In the 90s, they started to be very popular. So that's why some, design, some designers decided to, okay, why don't we modify our architecture a little bit and we introduce some uh, sort of uh, new capability to take advantage of what we already have in the system, but modify it in a way that we can execute SIMD uh, operations as well. And here you have uh, a very nice example. You have here two 30, actually three 32-bit uh, uh, registers and observe that these uh, three registers are divided into pieces of eight bits. Um, in the end, well, what these SIMD instructions do is that they operate using the same registers that the machine already have. You know that uh, in a real world processor we have 32-bit registers or 64-bit registers. So what we do here is that we divide them, in this particular case, in four pieces of each byte, each bits each. Um, and uh, we can uh, execute, uh, we can perform the computation on every piece of eight bits. The only thing that we need to do is modifying the ELU to avoid uh, carries uh, uh, between uh, consecutive 8-bit values. So we don't need to carry uh, the um, uh, carry out bit from bit 7 to bit 8, right? But if we do that, we can have four operations in parallel. And uh, this is what is, it, it's called a P at 8. It's a uh, pack add. So they are called pack add because in the same addition we have, uh, in this case, four in exactly four additions. So, um, yeah, a little bit more about that. Uh, one instruction can operate uh, simultaneously on multiple data elements, and uh, it's not only the example that we have seen in the previous slide. Uh, actually, uh, here, the way that we can use each of these 64-bit registers is 
with each of these four configurations that we have here. So depending on what's the opcode, I don't know, for some reason, okay, now I see it. Um, um, depending on what's the opcode, the specific uh, operation code that we have in the instruction, the hardware will use each of these registers as eight 8-bit eight bytes or uh, four 16-bit words or two 32-bit uh, double words or as one single 64-bit uh, word. Uh, the stride is always one, so this is a limitation of these seamed extensions. It's different from what we uh, were discussing today and observe also that we don't need to define a, a, a vector length. And why is that? Because uh, uh, somehow um, um, uh, implicitly in the, in the operation code, we are defining what's the vector length, right? It can be eight, uh, four, or two. And here we have one example of uh, use of MMX. This example you can find, uh, let's say, like the complete explanation in, in, the, in the recommended paper. But uh, it's a, a really nice example to see how efficient uh, these MMX extensions can be for, uh, for uh, image processing. In this particular case, in the example, what we have is, you know, like, uh, for example, when you, when you uh, watch on TV uh, the weather forecast, you know that there is a... Uh, weather man or weather woman and 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 uh, be, behind the the guy or the or the woman what you see is the map of switzerland of uh, canton zurich or whatever and some suns clouds many clouds this week and uh, but but the truth is that that's not there you know that right switzerland is not right behind this guy what do you, what this guy uh, has is a, a chroma, what is called a chroma. It's just a surface with, with one single color, typically green or blue or something like that. So in this particular case, in this example, uh, the background uh, behind the woman is uh, blue. And what we want to do is put, let's say, the shape of the woman on top of another background, more beautiful one. So what we uh, need to do here is to first generate what is called a bit mask. And with this, this bit mask essentially is having uh, ones or zeros uh, where the woman is and having zeros or one around her. And the way of doing that, observe with this packed uh, compare equal byte instruction, that's what this mnemonic here means. What we are doing, we are comparing each of these uh, bytes, it, each of these uh, eight bit elements blue with the uh, value that it's coming from the image. So um, from the image, the image, this image, right? The, the, the input image with the woman. So if the uh, particular pixel, these eight bits are blue, we will put one in the output. That's how we generate the mask. If it's uh, not blue, then we put zero in the output. And now we are going to use this mask. So by the way, this is the sequential code that we would use uh, if we want to do this in a sequential machine. We have a for loop. We have to go over all the pixels of the image from zero to image size. And then we check, OK, the pixel that I just got from uh, memory, this XI, is it blue or not? If it's blue, um, yeah, if it's blue, then I copy uh, the corresponding pixel from the from the, uh, the, the 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 blossom background. The blossom background is the the beautiful background here, and I put it in the new image. And uh, if it's uh, if it's not blue, then I, it's it's because it's a pixel that belongs to the woman. So I take this pixel and I put it in the output. That's the sequential computation that we need to apply here. But we can do it much more efficiently if we use MMX instructions. So uh, so that's more or less the. Uh, flow of computation here. We need to, after having generated the mask with the uh, previous instruction that we had in the previous slide, uh, we um, apply this mask to the blossom image, which is contained in MM4, in this register MM4, and to the women's image, which is contained in uh, this MM3. So we end uh, the uh, blossom image and the woman's image with the mask. And then we obtain some output, and the only thing that we need to do is uh, ORing uh, the, the result of the uh, previous operation. You have the entire code here. You can 
think uh, yourself about how exactly it works, but it's uh, pretty simple as you will see. And if you need a little bit more detail or a little bit more explanations, you can ask me right now, later, or read the paper. Is that fine? Okay, so then we are done with the SIMD processors, with the SIMD extensions, and now we are ready to start talking about the GPUs, which essentially is going to be to uh, recall many of the concepts that uh, yesterday and today have already covered, plus taking into account some other concepts that were discussed and presented in previous uh, lectures. Uh, if I'm not wrong, in a previous lecture, uh, we were talking about uh, fine-grained multithreading. Do you remember that? What is fine-grained multithreading about? Uh, it's uh, hardware that has, it's an architecture where we have multiple thread context. And for each thread context, we have one program counter and registers. So this means that on the same pipeline, we can execute several threads at the same time. And each of these threads, it's running its own code. So that's why in each of these threads, uh, so each of these threads has its own program counter and its own registers. And uh, why is that useful? Because we can uh, take advantage of all the pipeline cycles. Recall that one of the uh, problems in pipelining is that if you are executing a thread, uh, a sequence of instructions, and there are dependencies among these instructions, at some point you might need to stall uh, the pipeline, right, and, and create some bubbles that actually are useless. So it's uh, some uh, cycles, some slots that we are not really using, but we need to have them to ensure that the program runs correctly. Uh, one way of dealing with that is having multiple threads running on the same pipeline so that uh, we avoid the dependencies because each of these threads is running a different program. And that's essentially what fine-grained multithreading is about. And that's um, uh, what you can uh, read in detail in these slides. What we do in a fine-grained multithreading machine is that we switch to another thread every cycle, such that no two instructions from a thread are in the pipeline concurrently. So this means if I'm executing one instruction for thread zero and another instruction for thread one and another instruction for thread three, uh, there is no dependence among all these instructions, so I don't have to worry about stalling the machine uh, from time to time, you know, if there are, because there are no dependencies. So this uh, way of uh, executing uh, instructions uh, that you can find in uh, fine-grained multi-threaded uh, CPUs like for example, this one, where you have, you see here, in this one, how many threads can we uh, execute at the same time? Four, right? Because we have four program counters. So we can have four threads, and each of the program, or in each of the threads will have its own uh, general purpose registers, as you can see here in the middle of the pipeline. So this way of uh, using the pipeline by executing uh, several threads in different uh, stages of the pipeline, uh, it's something that we are also going to use on GPUs. So now think about uh, some of the concepts that we have already covered in the course. We started with pipelining, and we already know that CIMD processors use pipelining, right? And also GPUs, of course, all these uh, functional units that we have in the GPU, they are also pipeline. Uh, we know that GPUs are a mix of uh, array processors and vector processors. So uh, they are CIMD processors uh, in the end. And the last thing is that they are also going to use this uh, fine-grained multi-thread execution, which means that I'm going to have like different streams of instructions executing in the same uh, SIMD pipeline. And every cycle, I'm going to issue an instruction for a different stream. These uh, streams of instructions are actually called warps, okay? And each of these warps has a certain width, which is typically 32, and it's uh, more or less the same as the vector length that we were uh, uh, describing uh, in yesterday's lecture. Okay, you can uh, yeah, recall all these um, advantages and disadvantages by yourself. 
And now I think we are ready to start with uh, graphics processing units. Why are they called graphics processing units? That's the first question to answer, because in the very beginning, they were designed to, uh, to run graphics workloads, right? Uh, they are highly parallel, same as the graphics that we need to generate for a, a computer display. And, uh, and that's why uh, this is their original name. But uh, in the last decade, let's say, they have started being used for general purpose computation as well. And why is that? Because they have a lot of uh, computing elements and probably it's very useful to uh, execute, uh, I don't know, linear algebra computation, for example, which is also uh, highly regular and highly parallelizable. Okay, uh, GPUs are SIMD engines underneath. This is something that you already know. The instruction pipeline operates like a SIMD pipeline. It's um, more or less like an array processor. But it's not only an array processor, it's also a vector processor because uh, you, we have many processing elements that can execute different types of instructions, but then we will also have some specialized uh, processing elements, as you will see uh, later. The interesting thing here in GPUs, and recall uh, one slide that we had yesterday where we talked uh, about something that uh, Fisher said in his paper, it's very difficult to program SIMD processors. The, one of the advantages of current GPUs is that the programming models has evolved in a way that these days is much easier to program them. So even though they are still uh, SIMD engines underneath, SIMD machines, the way that we program them is not using vector instructions explicitly, uh, but using threads, and this makes the programming uh, much easier. We will talk also a little bit about programming later. Um, so, yeah, so to understand this, let's go back to our parallels about code the, the parallelizable code example that uh, we have been uh, discussing in the previous lecture, in the beginning of this lecture. But before that, we are going to distinguish between two important concepts. The programming model, which is a software concept, and the execution model, which is a hardware concept. And why is that important? Why is important at this point of the lecture to uh, be able to distinguish between these two? Because uh, uh, read the second sentence there. They are seeing the machines underneath, but we are not going to program them as if they were SIMD machines, but we are going to program them using threads. So what's the programming model? The programming model refers to how the programmer expresses the code, how we write the code. We could simply write a sequential code, just a sequential code, like this uh, uh, for loop that we have in our example, and we go over the 50 elements of the array and read one element, read other element, add them, and, and write to the uh, output array, right? We could do that. And then we could have a very, very smart compiler that generates vector code for us. So what's a programming model? What's what the uh, programmer has to do? Just write in sequential code. You know that, you, you understand that, right? So it's different how we program, how we write the code, and to, uh, from how the code is actually going to be executed. So the programming model can be sequential, can be data parallel, can be data flow, can be multi-threaded. We can use something like pthreads or OpenMP and directly generate uh, some uh, multi-threaded code. And why not? Maybe we write a parallel program with OpenMP, but in the end, our CPU is just a sequential CPU, one single core. What is our CPU going to do? Well, running all the threads one after the other, right? So you already see the difference between a programming model and execution model, which is the, uh, how the hardware executes the code underneath. And there we can have out of order processor, vector or array processor, data flow, multiprocessor, multi-threaded, et cetera. So the execution model can be different from the programming model. We can have a uh, von Neumann model implemented on an out-of-order processor, or we can have an SPMD model implemented by a SIMD processor. SPMD means single program multiple data, and that's actually a, a, a multi-threaded programming model that is uh, the one that we use on GPUs, and um, that's uh, what the, the code that the uh, programmer writes, and underneath the execution will be as uh, if it was, a, as actually it is, a SIMD processor. So that's why um, it's good to uh, be able to uh, differentiate these two. 
So uh, how can you exploit parallelism here? We have our uh, a scalar sequential code, that uh, for loop that uh, we are using uh, in this in uh, yesterday and today's uh, lecture. So let's examine three programming options to exploit instruction level parallelism present in this sequential code. The very first uh, thing is the sequential or SIMD. The second one is so CSD. Uh, the second one is data parallel or SIMD. And the third one is multi-threaded, MIMD or SPMD. Recall that MIMD means multiple instruction, multiple data. SPMD is uh, single program, multiple data. As you will see, they are kind of uh, similar things. So the first one, programming model sequential. What do we do in programming model sequential? Nothing different than that. So we have our for loop and we start uh, running this uh, for loop iteration by iteration. We need to first load from one array, load from the other array, add and store. And then we go to the second iteration. Uh, this CSD program, this sequential program, can be executed on a pipeline processor something that you already know, an in-order pipeline processor where we start issuing and uh, fetching, decoding, uh, executing instructions one by one. We can do this in an out-of-order execution processor where we can have some sort of instruction level parallelism. The, the, the uh, uh, processor starts um, issuing independent instructions uh, because it has some instruction window that allows it to do it. And uh, it's a kind of uh, loop unrolling by hardware, as Professor Mudlu explained um, in, the, in the corresponding lecture. Or we could use a superscalar or VLIW processor, right? We can have something like this code, and then we have our uh, smart uh, VLIW compiler that extracts the parallelism there, generates some pack instructions, and then uh, launches the pack instructions on the um, um, uh, VLIW uh, pipeline. So that is one possibility. We write a sequential code, and then we execute this sequential code on some specific hardware. And these are different possibilities for this uh, specific hardware. The second possibility is uh, using a data parallel programming model. And that's uh, um, what we do when we vectorize code. Uh, here we have our code, this is the uh, sequential code, and, and, and suddenly we realize that these iterations are independent. I, I'm saying we, but it could be also a compiler, it can be the programmer or the compiler. We realize that it, each iteration is independent, and because they are inter independent, they can be run in parallel, something like this, right? And for each of the instructions, we generate one vector instruction, and each of these vector instructions is going to be executed on the vector hardware, or the SIMD hardware. So uh, this is the vectorized code, vector load, another vector load, vector add, and vector store. So that's where are we going to execute this? Probably on a, a SIMD processor, right? But observe one interesting thing here. I could directly write something like that let's say high level language code. I could, I could write something like vector load, vector load, vector addition, vector store. And then I can have a compiler that generates code for this program to be executed on a sequential processor, for example. So uh, today we will introduce a little bit of uh, the CUDA programming language, which is a um, um, uh, programming language for NVIDIA GPUs. But there is another uh, very similar programming language that is called OpenCL. Have you ever heard about OpenCL? OpenCL is open, so it can, uh, it's, it's cross-platform so, uh, and cross-vendor, so you can run it on NVIDIA GPUs, on AMD GPUs, but also on CPUs. And the way that you write this program is using an SPMD programming model. So you write parallel program. But in the end, you can have a compiler for CPU that generates the corresponding code for the corresponding uh, assembly program with the corresponding ISA for a sequential machine. So it's another example of uh, this uh, difference between the programming model and the execution model. And then the third option, the uh, third uh, um, uh, programming model is the multi-threaded. The, the OpenCL example could be a good one for this. Again, the realization is that each iteration is independent, 
And now, instead of generating uh, vector instructions, what we have here is like different threads running in parallel. So where could we execute something like this? We could execute that in a MIMD machine, because for example, each of these iterations can run on each of the cores of a multi-core CPU, or this can also be executed on a SIMD machine, and that's what GPUs uh, are. Um, yeah, this is an, another way of uh, talking about, I mean, the, and describing GPUs is single instruction, multiple thread architecture, but this is more like NVIDIA terminology, I would say. Okay, so a GPU is a SIMD or SIMT machine, uh, except it's not programmed using SIMD instructions. I hope that this is already clear or starts to be clear. We program it using threads. It's a SPMD uh, programming model, and each thread executes the same code but operates on a different piece of data. Uh, each thread has its own context, uh, context, and a set of threads are going to be uh, divided or grouped into something that are called the warp or the wavefront. Uh, what is warp and what is wavefront? It's exactly the same. Warp is NVIDIA terminology, wavefront is AMD terminology. Over the rest of the lecture, we will talk about warps, um, simply because it's shorter. There's no other reason. <laughs> Okay, and uh, what's the warp? It's essentially a SIMD operation performed by hardware. And now, uh, yeah, let's recap a little bit using this slide. How are we gonna program the GPU? Using the SPMD programming model. SPMD is similar to MIMD. This means that I can write the code for every thread as, is, as if every thread were independent from any other thread, okay? But the truth is that the way that this code is going to be executed is on a SIMD machine. So what we are actually going to have in the hardware is a, a SIMD pipeline. So in the end, what we do is clustering these iterations, clustering it, these threads into something that are called the warps. What is a warp? In the case of NVIDIA, it's 32 threads. In the case of AMD, 64 threads. In the case of your exam question, sometimes will be 32, sometimes will be 64. The way that you have to reason is exactly the same. What do we do with these iterations? Uh, each of them is assigned to a thread. And now, what the hardware will do is taking groups of these threads and putting them together in this warp. And when we start executing the instructions on the hardware, we will be issuing instructions for every 32 threads, for every warp. That's why here, now, we no longer have something called vector instruction, but observe, we have there warp, warp zero at PCX. So this load instruction is uh, stored in, uh, in, in, in a particular address that we have in the program counter. The address is X in memory, and this uh, instruction is going to be executed for warp zero. Why warp zero? Because we are going to have more than one warp in each of the uh, SIMD pipelines. So after um, executing this instruction, we will execute the next instruction, next load, again for warp zero, and then the next instruction is an addition, again for warp zero, and then the next instruction uh, is stored for warp zero, okay? But recall, they are also multi-threaded machines, so we have no single warp. We, we are going to have more than one warp. So for now, only warp zero, but you will see soon that we are going to uh, start executing instructions for many more warps. Okay, any questions until now? Okay. I think all these, uh, so we, we are going to keep, let's say, iterating over all these concepts uh, over the course of the lecture, so I think that they will be uh, more and more clear uh, every time. Uh, when, you, when we say warp, uh, warp zero, and it is uh, specified by NVIDIA as size 32, would this be the same as iterating the first from i is equal to zero to i is equal to 32 of the for loop all at once? i equal to 31. We have a, yes, it's a good question. Uh, very, very timely question. 
we have our, our for loop from zero to n, right? And what are we gonna have to do? We know the realization is that all these iterations are independent, so we can run them in parallel. So what are we gonna do? When we write the CUDA program, this, the, the GPU program, what we are going to do is distributing all these n iterations among all the available threads. By the way, the threads are a software concept, so we can use n threads if we want. One single thread per iteration, right? And now we start executing the program on the hardware. And what's the hardware going to do? Say, okay, I have to execute n threads, but my CMD unit, it's only 32. So let's take the first 32 threads, create one warp, and for this warp of 32 threads, are going, I'm going to start executing these instructions. So iterations zero to 31 will be warp zero, iterations 32 to 63 will be warp one, and so on. Okay? Okay, let's have the break. Okay. Uh, we still have a, a few slides to cover, so let's continue. Uh, SIMD versus SIMT execution model. Let's uh, start talking about more uh, differences. Uh, SIMD, a sequential instruction stream of SIMD instruction. We have only one uh, sequential instruction stream of SIMD instructions. In SIMT, we have multiple instruction streams of scalar instructions. And this is because we write the code for threads, okay? Uh, so that's why we say we have multiple instructions, instruction streams. And, uh, and we talk about scalar instructions because that's the way we write the code, even though they will be later executed at, as vector instructions on the hardware. Uh, and there are two advantages of doing this. There are two advantages of um, using the GPUs uh, in, or designing the GPUs in this way. The first thing is that we can treat each thread separately. So we can write code for um, every thread as if it was independent. And the good thing is, I mean, the very good thing of that, or, or the best thing of that, is that it's um, uh, making uh, programming much easier. That's the main advantage. Um, but we talk about fine-grained multi-threading multi of, of warps. Recall, we have already introduced the concept of warp. We already know that the warp in NVIDIA GPUs is 32 threads and uh, the GPU is a multi-thread architecture, so recall it's pipeline, it uh, has uh, some uh, things, some concepts from vector processors, other concepts from array processors, and they are also multi-threaded processors. So in the previous slide, we were talking about warp zero, this instruction for warp zero, and this instruction for warp zero, and this instruction for warp zero, but the truth is that we have more than one warp. Actually, in the current GPUs, I think we can have up to 64 warps in the same GPU core, which is one of these uh, stream multiprocessors that you might be already be uh, uh, reading in, in, the, in the required paper. So uh, the way that we are actually executing the instructions for the warps is in a multi-threaded manner. Let's assume that we have, let's say, 20 warps. What is the hardware going to do? We will have a hardware, we will have a warp scheduler, which is a unit that decides what's the next instruction to execute. Let's say that the next instruction is this load instruction. So what the hardware does is, okay, I have to fetch this instruction, this load instruction, and issue onto the hardware for which warp? In this case, for warp zero, which are threads zero to 31. Recall the uh, example that uh, we had right before the break. And then we launch another, a new load instruction. And in this case is load instruction for warp one. Observe that this is warp one at PCX and this is warp zero at PCX. It's PCX because in both cases, it's the same instruction. They are executing the same code, right? So uh, the load instruction is in address X of memory for both warps, warp zero and then warp one, and then for some reason, the warp scheduler decides to uh, execute this instruction, which is for warp 20 and is this add instruction that is in PCX uh, plus two. 
and then, and then next slide. But you see already how, how it goes, right? It's multi-threaded, so we start executing instructions from different warps in the same way as in the um, um, multi-thread processor that we uh, saw in the beginning, we were launching instructions from different threads. Okay, um, yeah, uh, this is uh, more or less uh, the same thing. You have the SIMD pipeline where you have the functional units and uh, we start uh, launching instructions from, from uh, the different uh, warps. Uh, here you uh, see the definition of uh, warp and you can figure out what's uh, the reason why they decided to use uh, that, uh, that name. Okay, uh, a little bit more detail about the architecture of the GPU. You should already be uh, familiar with this figure as well if you have started reading the paper. Here we have the memory with the memory controller, uh, different uh, memory channels. Here we have an interconnection network and on the other side we have the shader cores. This shader cores, this uh, terminology shader core is coming from the graphics field. Uh, in the paper, probably they are called streaming multiprocessors, okay? And uh, here in this, uh, in this class, we call them SIMD pipeline, okay? Uh, so observe that here is where we have our SIMD pipeline that actually is composed by, as if he ha we had like four pipelines in parallel in this, uh, in this uh, pictorial representation, but each of these is one functional unit and they are uh, pipeline. Uh, somehow uh, we, we uh, have here, uh, well, at least part of the pipeline, we have here the PC and the mask because for each warp, we are going to have one uh, program counter and one mask. Recall that we need the mask to uh, do the predicated execution. We still have, uh, of course, predicating it's predicated execution. Um, uh, and the GPUs, um, here we have an iCache, it's an instruction cache where we store um, the program, the instructions that we need to execute and here the decode stage and then we uh, issue the instruction onto the um, Scalar, I mean the, the, the SIMD pipeline. And uh, yeah, with a little bit more detail and, and here you can again see the multi-threaded execution of warps. So. Uh, let's launch one instruction for warp zero and then launch one instruction for warp eight. So this was seven, warp eight, warp three, and so on. And we have our instruction fetch stage, uh, decode stage. Here you can see the register, here the ALU. This is the memory, in this case, the uh, data cache uh, and uh, the write back stage. So this more or less corresponds to the stages that you already know, the typical stages that you already know in the pipeline. Uh, the exact detail is not like that uh, actually, but this is uh, somehow um, uh, simplified uh, representation of, of the pipeline. But uh, um, the, um, the important concept is it's there. Okay, uh, recall this slide says, okay, you already know this slide, right? And now instead of talking about vector processors, we talk about GPUs. And what do we execute in GPUs? We execute warps. And these warps have 32 threads. So if I want to execute this add instruction that I have there uh, on a certain number of uh, functional units, I might have one or I might uh, have four. So if I have four, and I have 32 threads, how will I execute this specific add instruction on these four? Well, I will start for thread zero, thread one, two, and three at the same time, and after that, I will uh, start the execution for thread four, five, six, and seven, right? Um, the, you also know this slide as well. Now, instead of talking about uh, about um, uh, yeah, uh, vector registers, observe that here uh, we have changed uh, the labels here and now these are registers of thread IDs 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, etc. But the, 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 the idea here is to show that uh, this, uh, this uh, didn't change, right? It's still, it's a, it's a Cindy machine underneath. And now also this slide, going back to the idea of I have 
uh, certain, I mean, my vector length was 32 in the example when, when I showed this slide in the beginning of the lecture. Now I don't talk about uh, vector length, I talk about warp size and the warp size is 32, but I only have eight lanes. So I can only execute the instruction for eight of the threads at the same time. So I need to uh, do the entire execution for the entire warp in four cycles. But observe how uh, here we are issuing this uh, load instruction on the load unit for warp zero and then one multiply instruction for warp one and then one uh, add instruction for warp two and this one is for warp three and so on. So, and maybe uh, right after finishing with this load here, maybe here I can run something for warp, uh, execute something for warp uh, four or maybe again for warp zero. This is something that the uh, warp scheduler will decide. Okay. Yeah, and this is uh, um, somehow uh, related also to the, to the example that uh, we were discussing uh, right after the, the, the break. Uh, we have uh, this uh, operation that we need to do uh, whatever with some uh, vector, in this case, N is 16, and what we do is dividing the computation uh, among the, the available works. Yeah, go ahead. We had the same, yeah, we've seen that before, but the thing is, if we have eight processing elements or SNMs or however you really call them, um, how can, if we only have eight, how can they do an add and a, multi and a multiplication at the same time? Wouldn't they have to be split on to eight different uh, processing elements? Yeah, so uh, this doesn't exactly match uh, the, uh, the, whatever you have in the SM, in the NVIDIA architecture, I agree on that. Okay, so it's not, it's not matching. No, no, it, it's not exactly like that. But, uh, so uh, essentially because uh, multiplications and additions are executed on the same pipeline, the, uh, those SPs that you uh, can, can read in the paper. We are going to see them in, in, in a couple of slides. <coughs> Let, let's go back to the question. Okay, so this, this was the idea, how we divide the computation. I have to operate on this array and now, well, I write some code so that I assign threads to each of the iterations, but in the end, what the hardware is going to do is uh, packing these threads 32 uh, after 32 in wars, war zero, war one, war two, and so on. Um, but um, and, and, and now uh, a little bit more about the uh, GPU uh, programming model. We were talking about SPMD. The warps are not really exposed. We uh, write the code for threads. And actually the way that uh, we write the code is uh, defining the threads. We define certain number of threads, but from the software pers perspective, and this is actually uh, assumed that this is uh, CUDA code, uh, from the software per perspective, we organize these threads into something called blocks, thread blocks. Um, in OpenCL, I was talking about OpenCL before, they are not called threads and blocks, they are called work items and work groups, but they are essentially the same. And uh, here, for example, if I want to define, let's say, uh, 1,024 threads in total, I will have to group these 1,024 threads in smaller groups that, I, that are called um, blocks. And uh, what's the size of these blocks? Whatever the programmer wants. Let's say, for example, 128. So if I tell you that my thread blocks, you see here, uh, n block, n thread. So I will say, okay, the size of my block is going to be 128, and I'm going to launch, let's say, four of these blocks. So in total, I will have five, 12 threads, right? But now, I have four blocks of 128 threads. What is the hardware going to do with that? Can you guess? Well, it cut, cut it down into its own size, right? It's in its own? It's in its own size, possibly because we only have put to, uh, a lot of points to put to, uh, not to cut it down. Exactly. So what the hardware is going to do, which each of this group of 128 threads that are called blocks, is each of them is going to be mapped into one of the CMD pipelines. And there, 
the, the hardware will say, okay, I have to execute 128 threads. If I divide 128 by 32, I have four warps. So now I have warp zero, warp one, two, and three, and I will start executing instructions for warp zero, let's say the load instruction for warp zero, and then a load instruction for warp one, and then a load instruction for warp two, and so on. Okay? Is it up on up to the programmer to find the correct uh, block size? Because if you have a huge block size, you would have to run a lot of uh, warps. So there is a, an actual limitation of the maximum block size, which is uh, 1,024. But other than that, you could use whatever you want. But it gets inefficient. It gets inefficient if you use, let's say, 129. Why? Because you have to reload it for the one. Uh, exactly. Because we would be using one entire warp, let's say warp 5, for one single thread. Let's say 31 lanes or 30, 31 uh, CMD functional units will be completely unused because we only need to use one of them. So, yeah, it's, uh, let's say, programmer's responsibility to use, uh, if possible, it should be possible uh, almost always, um, a multiple of the warp size. Okay. Uh, Actually, let's take a look at, uh, at some uh, code. This is our, our first uh, approach to, the, to GPU code. Here we have, as usual, our uh, vector addition. It's uh, C code, or yes, it's C code, sequential code for CPU. We need to uh, add element-wise these two vectors, A and B, and store the result in C. And uh, what do we do if we want to uh, translate this into CUDA or into OpenCL? Essentially observe that the body of this function, by the way, the functions in CUDA are called kernels, the, the body of this kernel is exactly the same. We are reading uh, array A from array B. We are adding and storing uh, the output in array C. But now, instead of having this II as the index of the for loop, what we have is this TID. And the TID is the thread ID. It's the number that identifies the thread among all the threads that are available and running on the GPU, on all the threads that the programmer has defined. Observe also that this thread ID is a function of the block dimension, 128 in the uh, previous example, times the block index. So if I have two blocks of 128 threads, the first block will be thread from 0 to 127, and the second, uh, uh, what did I say, the, th the first um, block will be from 0 to 127, and the second block from 128 to 255. Uh, and that's why uh, I, I finally add this thread ID, which is the ID of the thread within each thread block. I guess that might be, uh, must be clear. Here you have the, the same code with a little bit more uh, complexity, I would say. I mean, it's not actually more complexity because uh, this is uh, essentially uh, the same code. We are still adding two arrays, but instead of uh, adding, uh, so the two arrays are, 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 are like a matrix, right? So it's two matrices. We are adding two matrices here because we have this, uh, uh, double uh, for loop here. But uh, essentially it's the same. The good thing in CUDA and OpenCL is that we can define uh, blocks of uh, one single dimension or two dimensional or even three dimensional. So in this particular case, observe that we have uh, thread index X, thread index Y, because we are uh, indexing the threads in both dimensions and also uh, the blocks. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time to go deeper today into the uh, GPU programming language, but maybe um, we might have a chance in a later lecture. Anyway, if you are interested, just uh, talk to me. And now uh, let's take a closer look at the at the what are called the streaming multiprocessors in NVIDIA terminology but uh, actually one of these SIMD pipelines, that is the, the way that we are uh, talking about them uh, in, throughout this lecture. And, um, and, and recall that we were uh, saying the programmer defines blocks 
but then when these blocks go to the hardware, I will map one of these blocks into one of these streaming multiprocessors, and what the streaming multiprocessor is going to do is decomposing these uh, blocks into warps of 32 threads. And now, every time that we launch one instruction, we launch the instruction for one particular warp. Uh, you can already observe the difference between this SM here, which corresponds to NVIDIA Fermi architecture released in 2010, you can compare it to the uh, SM that you have in the, in the paper, which is an architecture from 2006 or 2007. This is more complex, right? Instead of having only uh, eight of the SPs, eight of the scalar pipelines, of the lanes, here we have 32, you see? these uh, green little squares. Uh, the thing is that uh, still, so here, uh, the warps are executed, warps are still 32 threads, and they are executed on each of these groups of 16 SPs. So you need two cycles for the execution of the entire warp. So the good thing is that you can have one warp executing here, another warp executing here, and actually more than one, more than one, right? Because these are pipelines, so it's one warp every cycle. Uh, when you say a warp is executed every one cycle, do you mean a new instruction? Is fetched? A, new, a new instruction is fetched and issued on the pipeline, but the, then, then you have a certain width of the pipeline. If I recall correctly, it's kind of 24 pipeline stages. It's something like that. But also, going back to the, to the idea of uh, GPUs are a mix of array processors and vector processors. You remember that, right? And you were asking me, um, where do I execute the addition and where do I execute the multiplication? So additions and multiplications are executed here in the SPs. So from that point of view, these are kind of array processor. Right? Because it's the same processing element can execute different instructions. But then observe that there are two more types of uh, processing elements here. These are load and store. So these are load and store units. But then we also have this SFU. These are called special function units. And these are used for more complex computations, like for example, transcendental functions, sine, cosine. And, and, and these kind of instructions. And also, another interesting thing is, instead of having 16, as, as we have here, we only have four. So if we have four, what does it mean? How many cycles do we need per warp? More than two, right? Okay, so that's uh, NVIDIA Fermi architecture. You can go and take a look at Kepler architecture, Maxwell, Pascal, and Volta, and Turing, and in each of these architectures, you will see uh, some differences, sometimes they have more SPs, less SPs. They are changing, let's say, improving the, the architecture from generation to generation, but essentially they are uh, the same, or the way that they internally work is uh, very similar. Okay, um, yeah, I think it's uh, time to start uh, uh, summarizing on this. Uh, traditional SIMD contains a single thread, Sequential instruction execution in warp-based SIMD, what we have is multiple scalar threads executing in a SIMD manner, okay? This must be uh, already uh, clear. Uh, programming language, a programming model is not SIMD, it's something called SPMD, and uh, it's the hardware, uh, the responsible one for uh, taking these threads and creating these warps and executing the instructions for these warp, warps in a uh, SIMD manner. Um, a little bit more about the uh, single procedure or single program, uh, multiple data uh, programming model. It's, it's a programming model rather than a computer, computer organization. Um, each processing element executes the same procedure except on different data elements. It is possible to synchronize uh, different warps at uh, some points in time. We are not going to go into this detail. If we have time to talk uh, in a later lecture about uh, programming, we will talk about that. But uh, yeah, you can uh, have, I mean, rec I mean uh, have in mind that uh, these warps, it's also possible to synchronize somehow if it's necessary in your program. And um, uh, multiple instruction streams execute the uh, same program. So, uh, 
recall that we will talk about uh, advantages of uh, SIMT. The first one was that each thread was treated separately because we just write the uh, program as if they were individual threads. Another possible potential advantage is that we could uh, flexibly group threads. This is not something, as far as I know, that real GPUs do, but it's something that could be uh, implemented. And it's not that difficult. And you will see uh, in which cases this can be useful. Uh, yesterday, we were talking about uh, predication. We were talking about the vector mask. And the reason why uh, we uh, needed this vector mask is because we want to write vector programs and also GPU programs where we can uh, follow different paths of execution. Right? And instead of using branches, what we do is uh, using, so these are the different paths of execution for different, for different threads. So um, in, 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 in this uh, type of uh, SIMD architectures, what we do instead of using branches explicitly, what we do is using mask. So if, for example, I have, uh, this is my, my warp, these this, uh, arrows here represent each of the threads. And I have one instruction, first instruction, that is the same for the 32 threads of the warp, and then I have a branch, and I launch the branch for all the threads at the same time, but now uh, some of the threads will go uh, through path A, and the other threads will go through path B. And these threads, for example, these four threads go through path A, these other four threads go to path B, and then they reconverge and they continue um, the execution. So um, what's the uh, problem here? I mean, how, how do we implement this in the real hardware? Using a mask. So uh, in the branch, we uh, generate the mask so that uh, uh, here we will have a bit equal to one, here bit equal zero, bit equal one, one, zero, zero. So these instructions in this path are only executed by these four threads, those that have uh, one in the mask, and then we will complement the mask and execute path B for the uh, remaining threads. So uh, the way that we uh, do this is uh, by, by using the mask, but the problem, it's, I think it's, uh, it's kind of uh, obvious here, the problem is that because we have this divergence, uh, we are wasting part of the resources, right? Because still we are, you know, using the, um, I mean, the functional units are there, but we are not using them, we are not using the functional unit that is here or the functional units that are here. So um, the idea of grouping the threads flexibly, it uh, could potentially allow to have more uh, efficiency in the execution. Consider two warps, warp X and warp Y, and they are ready to execute the same instruction. Let's say one addition. But it turns out that they are going, I mean, the threads in these warps are going through different paths, and now uh, we have that, let's say, path A, it's only going to be uh, uh, followed by uh, these threads in warp X and these threads in warp I. What could I do? They are different warps, right? The proposal here, what we could do, is merging these two partial warps, let's say. And we can do it in this particular case because the thread corresponding to this slot is, doesn't exist or is not going to go through the same path in warp X, but it goes in warp I, and, and the same for uh, these slots here. So they could be occupied by threads belonging to different warps. So this would be a way of uh, creating, generating the warps flexibly. And in this way, when I execute this merge uh, warp Z, I would be uh, using more of the functional units. So I would be more efficient in the execution. In some cases, we will have kind of uh, overlap and we cannot completely merge them. So uh, still we will need to launch two warps. That's uh, essentially the idea that was proposed in this paper, and, uh, and here uh, you can see uh, some nice example. So this, uh, on top you have the baseline, and you see that some of the warps are incomplete, are, are running only, let's say, three threads or one thread here, etc. So on the fly, what the hardware could do is merging some of these so, for example, here, these two warps here, they can be merged 
and these two can be merged and actually uh, in a in an, uh, very effective way, and we end up executing the thing in a smaller number of cycles. So this could be a, a something that, let's say, is not difficult to implement on a, a, a real GPU and could improve the, the um, execution of the warps. Um, yeah, this is uh, for you to think, because observe that in the proposal, uh, what we do is if, uh, uh, let's say, this slot here is uh, free and I have a thread in another warp that is ready to execute, I can merge these two so that this red thread, this red arrow occupies the space that some blue arrow is not occupying, right? So that's how I get the, um, the merge warp. But observe that I need to have a match between one empty slot a slot and one full slot here. The question is, can I, could I move threads flexibly? So if I have uh, a slot, empty slot here, but I have two threads that could go to this slot, could I move one of them uh, to, to another lane? Think about that. There might be, it might be possible, but there might be more requirements, right? Because the, the registers corresponding to the two threads that I want to, uh, to um, execute are exactly here in this lane. So somehow I would need to move those registers, the contents of those registers. I mean, it's just um, something for you to think. Um, here we have another, uh, this is from another paper from our group uh, with a, um, another way of improving the execution of warps. Uh, quite interesting as well. Uh, and actually in this paper, uh, there, there were proposed two solutions. One of the solutions of the, or the hardware improvements were for war, uh, was for branch divergence. You already know what uh, war, uh, branch divergence uh, means because it's the, the thing that uh, we have just seen in the previous slide. And the second thing is for long latency operations. What are the long latency operations? Here in the, in, in the past lecture and in this lecture, we are talking about executing uh, vector instructions or executing warps, and then we see that this is a very productive, right? We can achieve very high throughput because we launch one instruction and we will be obtaining one um, um, value, one result every cycle for an entire uh, CMD unit or for an entire vector, and seems to be like uh, very, very efficient, but it's still the access to memory is a bottleneck, a, a bottleneck. And why is that? Because accessing memory usually takes uh, many more cycles than executing instructions on, one, and on these SPs or, or CMD uh, pipelines, right? So uh, memory accesses are long latency operations. And usually when we start um, executing a program, we will have to go to memory and get data from memory, and after getting the data from memory, we can execute addition, we can execute multiplication, and so on. So usually what happens is that we start computing something for different warps, and at some point we need to go to memory. And when we need to go to memory, we have a long latency. So for example, this is a memory request from uh, warp zero starts at this point, and then we need to wait for all these many cycles to get the uh, values that we read from memory and bring them to registers, continue with the execution, and then for warp one is exactly the same, for warp 15, and so on. And what's the problem here? The problem is that the way that uh, uh, the GPU, the, the, within each of the SMs, within each of these GPU cores, the way that the warps are executed or their instructions from each warp are executed is in a wrong rowing manner. If I have 32 warps, I will start executing the first instruction for warp zero, and then the first instruction for warp one, and then the first instruction for warp two, and so on. And when I have launch the very first instruction for all the warps, then I go to the second instruction for warp zero, one, two, and so on. The problem with that is that uh, if the first instruction is the same for all the warps, let's say an addition, uh, all of them will execute this addition here. But at some point, all of them will start uh, requesting data from memory. And this memory access takes much longer. So what's, the, what's the, the problem? The problem is that I'm not using the cores. I'm not using the CMD pipelines during a lot of cycles. Why is that? Because all the warps 
are accessing memory. Uh, ideally, I could be using all these uh, slots, all, the, all these cycles here, uh, by executing arithmetic operations, additions, multiplications uh, on these cores. And this way, I could be hiding the latency, the, act, the, the, the latency of access uh, to the, to the uh, memory of the GPU. But unfortunately, I cannot do it very well. Uh, that's that's the, the, um, yeah, the second problem that in this paper is somehow solved. But for the first problem, for warp divergence, what they propose is some, actually somehow similar to what we have already seen. Remember that in the previous, in the previous uh, uh, um, solution, what we did is, okay, I have one warp of four threads and two of these threads are not there, so I only have two of them which need to go through this path, and in the other warp I have four, and these two are, and these two are not, so I merge them, right? And here, the proposal is kind of similar, but it's a different approach. Instead of merging different warps, what we do here is defining larger warps. Instead of having warps of, let's say, 32 threads, let's have longer warps with 128 threads. And then we are going to create kind of sub-warps and we are going to uh, launch the instructions for these sub-warps um, in a dynamic way. So uh, let's say that all of these ones are ze and zeros that represent the threads that actually are going to execute one specific instruction. Zero means that we don't execute the instruction. One means that we execute the instruction and the entire warp is, is divided in subwarps. But the way that we create these subwarps is by looking for ones and say, okay, let's launch all these four together, and then these four together, and then these three together. And this way, we can have uh, more, uh, a more efficient execution because we just need to launch, in this case, Three, instruction, three instructions for three sub-warps instead of launching uh, 16 instructions for 16 sub-warps of four threads each. Okay, if you are interested, you can uh, take a closer look at the paper and, and, and we can discuss it uh, offline if you want. Uh, going back to the long latency operations, what they propose is uh, dividing the total number of warps, and instead of applying simply round-robin scheduling, what they propose is to uh, group the uh, warps into groups of warps, so that they apply like a, a double round-robin scheduling. First they say, okay, let's uh, schedule uh, instructions for group zero of warps, and then schedule instructions for group one of warps. That's what they do here. So they say, okay, let's go first for group zero. And we do all the compute instructions for the warps that belong to group zero. And then we start um, issuing the memory requests for all the warps, in this case, warps zero to seven, which belong to group zero. And at the same time, we can be using the compute units, we can be using the arithmetic, uh, the, the, the SIMD pipeline um, to, um, um, to run uh, instructions for the warps that are in group one. And when we are done, then we start uh, doing the memory requests, in this case for warps eight to 15, which are the ones to belong to group one. So, and after that, more compute. And, it's, and as you can see, we can overlap memory accesses, these memory accesses with compute here, and we can also overlap these compute operations with memory accesses here and we end up reducing the total number of cycles. Okay, it's an academic uh, proposal to improve the uh, execution of the warps um, in real world GPUs and as you can see, it's uh, pretty uh, efficient. You can uh, take a look at the paper if you're interested. Um, we are very close to the end. Just want to show you a couple of uh, pictures from real world uh, GPUs. This is. NVIDIA GeForce GTX 285 was released in 2009. It's a pretty old one. This is the one that it's actually described in detail in this uh, paper about NVIDIA Tesla. Uh, observe that it says eight SIMD functional units per core. These are the eight SPs that you can see in each of the SMs. In the paper, 
Uh, they talk about uh, streaming multiprocessors. Here we talk about GPU cores. So we have 32, so sorry, 30 GPU cores. Each of them has eight CMD functional units. Um, here you can see a more, let's say, pictorial representation of this. I really don't like this figure too much. But I think it's uh, more clear the one that you have in the paper and also in the, the slide that I showed you. And, and here you see the entire layout with the 30 cores. And actually you can uh, see how uh, in this uh, graph how the GPUs have evolved since, uh, since uh, 2009 until 2017. Uh, you can see, okay, so how much they, they, their power uh, has increased. Uh, gigaflops from something, I don't know, maybe less than um, 1,000 uh, gigaflops up to 15,000 gigaflops, which, which is uh, quite a, an impressive uh, evolution. And this is uh, one of the most recent ones. This was released in 2017. Uh, and as you can see, it's much more powerful can compare the number of extreme processors. In the previous one was uh, 240, here is 5,000. Uh, 500, uh, 500, uh, 5,120, and this is the layout. You can find more uh, information about this in, in the uh, white paper that you can uh, read in the slide, and also uh, some blogs, uh, uh, NVIDIA blogs, like for example this one. As you can see, it's, uh, it has 80 of these GPU cores, so 80 of these CMD pipelines that we uh, have described uh, in the lecture is each of these, and uh, within each of them we have all these scalar cores, these SPs, which are the functional units. Uh, an interesting thing in, in this um, recent architecture is that they include some specialized cores that are, core, uh, are, are called tensor cores, and they are uh, specialized for deep learning to execute uh, matrix multiplication very fast, uh, something somehow similar to, it's a, probably something similar to having a mini systolic array uh, within each of these uh, GPU cores. Uh, they are uh, very optimized for matrix multiplication and for uh, operations that are needed for uh, deep learning. So um, yeah, it's uh, kind of uh, interesting hardware. And actually shows, you know, some, some uh, trend that is uh, pretty common nowadays in all computing systems is the heterogeneity of compute units, right? You see uh, uh, compute units here that are specialized for integer calculation or for floating point with 32 bits, for floating point with uh, double uh, precision and also these tensor cores. So we need to have this heterogeneity to be able to uh, run uh, things in the more efficient way. And uh, just like uh, the last slide uh, to finish with this lecture, some food for thought for you to think. I'm not going to give you the answers. Compare and contrast uh, GPUs and, and systolic arrays. The other day, Professor Mudlu explained the systolic arrays, but also recall that he uh, uh, told this anecdote uh, about uh, some students from Toronto, the University of Toronto, who had taken a a course about GPU programming and they implemented a neural network on, GP, uh, on a GPU and, and uh, they, they were able to train uh, a convolutional neural network uh, pretty fast and go to a contest and win the contest. So that was possible and the current uh, development of deep neural networks and artificial intelligence is uh, somehow very much enabled by GPUs but also by new, I mean, uh, recently, uh, uh, engineered architectures like um, uh, systolic arrays, what are they, uh, what, what is better? GPUs, systolic arrays, and you can think which one is better for much machine learning, which one is better for image vision, vision or, or for image vision uh, processing, uh, what types of parallelism each one exploit, um, something that you can uh, think about, recall GPUs have array processor, so something from the array processor, from the vector processor, multi-thread architectures, uh, pipeline architectures, and also what are the trade-offs of using one GPU or using one systolic array. So this is the uh, type of questions that we uh, continue studying and answering uh, 
uh, in later courses. Uh, the seminar in computer architecture that will take place in the fall semester and also in the spring semester in 2020 and the uh, computer architecture master's course in the next fall semester. That's all from my side. If you have questions, we still have two minutes. If you don't have any questions, have a nice weekend. Thank you very much for your attention.